Thank you for waiting. We will now begin the Tokyo London Financial Seminar 2022 Future Prospects of FinTech. Simultaneous translation service is provided today. Please utilize the interpretation function in Zoom. Please use the interpretation function of Zoom client. We'd like to open the seminar with a video message from Mr. Vincent Kivney, Lord Mayor of the City of London. Hello and konnichiwa from London. I'm delighted to speak to you today as part of the Tokyo London Financial Seminar. I'm Vincent Kivney, the 693rd Lord Mayor of the City of London. In this role, I act as an ambassador for the UK's financial and professional services sector. As we begin to emerge from the pandemic and restrictions start to lift, I hope to visit Japan soon. May I thank Governor Koike and the Tokyo Metropolitan Government for bringing us all together today. Today's seminar is a perfect example of the ongoing engagement between Tokyo and the City of London. Today, we will develop this partnership further by exploring opportunities for collaboration in the world of fintech. The UK has always been a country of innovation, and despite the pandemic, has retained its position as a global leader in financial services and fintech. We are still the top ranking fintech investment destination in Europe. The UK has over two and a half thousand fintech firms in operation, and investment into UK fintech stood at $4.1 billion in 2020. At the City of London Corporation, we are always looking for ways to improve on London's innovations and grow this sector. It's why we supported the Khalifa Review of UK FinTech, a comprehensive study spanning regulation, skills, investment, and international competitiveness. Our collaboration with the Financial Conduct Authority on a digital sandbox was the first of its kind in Europe, providing a digital testing environment, supporting innovation, and addressing challenges in tech development and adoption. As we look to the future, there will be many new opportunities for UK-Japanese fintech collaboration. Today, you will be hearing from Chris Cummings, CEO of the Investment Association, to explain more about the importance of fintech in investment management. Engine, their digital accelerator program, has driven broader adoption of new technologies across investment management and will continue to act as a catalyst for industry innovation. I look forward to hearing more from Chris and all of the speakers and fintechs about their ambitions over the course of today. With London as a preeminent center for fintech and Tokyo seeking to cement its position as an international financial center, there is so much more we can do together. The City of London stands ready to support you in whatever way it can. Thank you, and sayonara. Thank you so very much, Lord Mayor Kivni. Next, we would like to move on to the keynote speech. Here to talk to us about toward the digitalization of finance, we have with us the Vice Governor of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, Mr. Manabu Miyasaka. So, Vice Governor Miyasaka, the floor is yours. Hello, I am Miyasaka, Vice Governor of Tokyo. I'd like to take about eight minutes to make a presentation on this topic. Currently, Tokyo has a long-term strategy, and in that strategy, we have set out major risks that we must overcome. 
And we have defined two major crises confronting humankind. One is infectious diseases. Of course, currently we are under the COVID-19 pandemic. And even if it, we can overcome that, there would be increased threats of infectious diseases. And the second is climate crisis. So Tokyo going forward must battle the threat of infectious diseases and the climate crisis. And we must battle and overcome these two crises. That's very important for us. So I'd like to focus more on the second issue, the climate crisis. Currently, there's a global trend where decarbonization, all countries have issued various targets as a common target for mankind. And Tokyo, which is one of the biggest metropolises in the world, must play a very active role in this uh, battle. And there was a conference called the Davos Agenda. There, our governor uh, announced a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, which we call carbon half. And so she announced the policy of carbon half, and also we issued a climate emergency declaration called Time to Act, and also we have held a climate action kickoff meeting in one of the greatest metropolises in the world, Tokyo uh, Metropolitan Government, would like to play an active role. And not only policies, we have come up with concrete targets, for example, an ambitious goal for carbon half by 2030 and a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions compared to the year 2000, a Tokyo's energy consumption compared to year 2000, a 50% reduction, and also to make all new passenger car sales in Tokyo 100% non-gasoline by 2030. And these are ambitious goals which we are working very earnestly to realize within in the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Now, the responsibilities of cities in the 21st century uh, toward the next generation is, of course, one, to overcome the climate crisis. But at the same time, even if we overcome the climate crisis, if that has a negative impact on the quality of life of the next generation, then that would not be productive. Uh, so uh, currently climate tech and digital technologies will be utilized in order to overcome the climate crisis, but at the same time ensure and achieve a comfortable living for all citizens. And can we really achieve such a tremendous challenge? I think the power of finance must be fully mobilized. It'll have a very major effect because the power of finance is to leverage all and everything to accelerate innovation. It's wonderful. So uh, for cities which aim to overcome the climate crisis, we would certainly like to fully mobilize the power of finance. Now, Tokyo has a future strategy that is green and finance and digital times finance. And we are currently working very hard to achieve both. Now, we have compiled this into a, a new vision uh, called Global Financial City Tokyo Vision 2.0, which we have just recently formulated. Green and digital are the two, Q, two new keywords uh, around which we want to become a global financial city. The current version is a Vision 2.0. Uh, in the initial vision, we wanted to accumulate financial players like companies and human resources in uh, Tokyo. Uh, so it was a, a very general vision, but the most imminent challenge is uh, green and digital. Uh, therefore, we want to become a city that can play a leading role in the areas of green and digital finance. And that's why we have advanced the vision to 2.0. There are three pillars. One is green, that is the establishment of a robust financial market that helps solve social issues. And the second is digital, that is the digitalization of finance. And third, we want to accumulate various uh, players from around the world. And green digital player, through these uh, three pillars, we want to ramp up promotion. And this is not just an ambition. We must uh, set KPIs uh, to verify the degree of achievement. Uh, so we have some main KPIs for 2030. The number of fintech companies in Tokyo should be raised from 94 to more than double to 200. And the percentage of cashless payments in Tokyo, which is currently about 21 percent, uh, must be increased to about 80 percent. And the third KPI is 
Through the flourishing of various financial businesses, we want to have them boost the Tokyo GDP, so the boosting effect on the Tokyo GDP uh, by 10 trillion yen. Now, what are we doing to achieve this? Uh, please look at the Vision 2.0 uh, document for details, but there are three initiatives. One is there are many, many fintech companies being born around the world, and we want uh, to creates a conducive environment for all of these fintech companies to thrive here in Japan or Tokyo. And there are many young entrepreneurs who want to establish new fintechs and want to grow their companies, very ambitious youth. So we want to promote policies that can support and accelerate their growth. The second is promotion of digitalization of funds in term media areas. The TMG has created uh, several funds that we have invested in, and uh, we want to uh, promote the creation of new services through these funds so that we can play a leadership role. Third is the promotion of cashless payments. Uh, payments uh, to uh, government is becoming increasingly cashless. For example, in uh, Tokyo, we have many parks and many uh, art museums, etc., uh, where uh, the admission fees can only be paid in cash or used to be that way. But now, more than 90 percent of these establishments do accept cashless uh, payments. Uh, so, uh, all businesses which are not cashless. Well, well, there are many of them. Uh, so we believe that uh, Tokyo citizens uh, going forward will be able to visit any establishment without cash, but just with their cards. And we do hope that uh, we can promote the cashless payments in uh, small shopping districts with uh, small and medium-sized shops and uh, enterprises as well. So we want to build a huge investment chain with Tokyo at the hub. That's a grand vision. And we also want to reduce uh, cash transactions and create a Tokyo that is mostly cashless. So the challenges to be overcome by Tokyo would be first green and, of course, digital. And I think the delay in digitalization has become very apparent with the corona pandemic. and sustainable recovery. And of course, uh, Tokyo as a whole uh, must be promoted as a wonderful city of green technology and digital technology. And what we really need is the power of finance. Uh, by fully mobilizing the power of finance, we will be able to achieve sustainable recovery. So I do hope that the players in the financial market can form a community to help boost Tokyo into a truly global financial center. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Miyosaka. Next, Mr. Tomohiro Miura, Director of the FinTech Office, Councillor, Policy Planning Bureau, Financial Services Agency, will speak on the theme of financial digitalization for sustainable growth. Mr. Miura, please take the floor. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Tomohiro Miura, head of the FinTech Innovation Office at Japan's Financial Services Agency, JFSA. I'm responsible for the digitalization of financial services, including fintech in Japan. It's an honor to have this opportunity to share with the Tokyo London Financial Seminar what we expect from the development of fintech and from what point of view we consider policy measures. Digitalization in our society is advancing not only in UK and Japan, but also all over the world. In particular, the speed of digitalization in finance has been extremely intense because finance itself is based on information and data and is close to digital technology. In Japan, people began to use cash dispensers or what we call ATMs now, about 50 years ago. Now, 50 years later, almost everyone carries a smartphone which functions not only as a wallet, but also as a bank. Who could have imagined this 50 years ago? It is hard for us to foresee the future of financial services as well, 
50 years from now. One of the key drivers of financial services evolution is fintech. Let me share with you an example. More recently, users have been provided with financial services even without being aware they are paying money when purchasing products or services from non-financial companies. When non-financial companies sell products or services, they incorporate financial services and provide them to customers. This is what is known as embedded finance, and it is realized when financial institutions, fintech companies, and non-financial companies take advantage of their strengths and join hands. Another form of this is when financial institutions and fintech companies provide tools for solving social problems. For example, they plant trees every time a customer uses a certain amount of money. Such services are linked to solving the issues of climate change. Financial services cover various functions such as payment settlement, corporate finance, asset management, and household asset formation. Therefore, the evolution of financial services not only improves the efficiency of operations in the financial industry, but also leads directly to economic growth and the improvement of user convenience. Digitalization is a prerequisite for the evolution of financial services and fintech companies are leading this digitalization of financial services. We would like to support them in creating digital innovation, improving user convenience, a user experience, and developing our economy as a whole. On the other hand, the digitalization of financial services does not substantially change the degree of risks inherent in financial services. In promoting fintech, it is necessary to appropriately manage these inherent risks and ensure that users are protected. To clarify this point, I would like to touch on decentralized finance. It is sometimes referred to as DeFi, but the definition is not determined. In general, it is a financial system based on a blockchain network as permissionless distributed ledger technology. Digital assets, including crypto assets, are used to provide financial services similar to those in traditional financial systems, such as settlement, lending, and investment. One of the main features of DeFi is that it is not managed by a particular organization. Anyone can provide financial services without permission. The advantages of DeFi include the enhancement of robustness in financial systems due to the absence of a single point of failure and the realization of quick and low-cost transactions with the use of smart contracts. DeFi might also play a significant role from the perspective of financial inclusion if properly designed. Innovation can take place because anyone can be a service provider. As a result, DeFi market is growing rapidly, and it has been pointed out that internationally, not only retail investors, but also institutional investors are increasing investments in crypto assets, while the use of stable coins and tokens is also increasing. However, DeFi has a similar risks as traditional centralized finance. In addition, there are risks that require greater attention because of the nature of DeFi. For example, we can point out that there being no single no single point of failure makes it unclear who is responsible for the system, who is the subject to be regulated and supervised. There is a spread of risk due to increased interconnections among the DeFi, traditional centralized finance, and the real economy. There is provision of financial services with inadequate risk management that are out of regulatory oversight. There are risks of money laundering, terrorism financing, and facilitating misconduct due to anonymity and lack of KYC and AML CFT measures. Some in the business community say to us, not only in the context of DeFi, but also in that of FinTech as a whole, do not stop our endeavors or our efforts should not be subject to regulations. 
However, can services be sustainable when people cannot use, use them with ease in the case of emergency? Of course, each stakeholder, including regulators, the business community, and engineers have different roles to play, and it is natural that there are differences in their way of thinking. But regulators are also part of the ecosystem, along with other stakeholders. We believe that all stakeholders share the common belief in making Japan's financial markets more rational and attractive to all stakeholders and a place where high value added can be created. And to do that, we need to make an environment that promotes innovation while protecting users. Regulators play a major role in developing a regulatory framework, but better regulations are created when it is done, not solely by regulators, but together with multi-stakeholders based on the mutual understanding of the responsibilities and the roles they fulfill. It is clear that uh, fintech and financial digitalization as its base will contribute to the sustainable growth of the Japanese and global economies. So we are very much encouraged that the world's leading cities like London and Tokyo will play key roles in the financial ecosystem as international financial centers. Given that financial digitalization will advance even further going forward, we aim to establish better regulations and conduct proper supervision in order to promote innovation and protect users at a high level. Therefore, we would like to continue engaging in dialogue with stakeholders. From this point of view, I would like to express my gratitude again for being able to participate in the Tokyo London Financial Seminar, which is viewed by many stakeholders. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Miura. The next speech is about the future prospects for UK-Japan collaboration in the fintech sector. The speaker is the vice chairman of Fintech Association of Japan, Mr. Takeshi Kito. Mr. Kito, please. Thank you very much for that introduction. Now, I would like to talk about collaboration in the fintech sector, as was just introduced. So let me very briefly introduce myself. I am a fintech entrepreneur, and in the fintech industry, I am in charge of global partnerships at Fintech Association of Japan, and I'm also in the advisory committee for the government of Japan's regulatory sandbox. And at METI, I'm involved in agile governance and also expert group on data free flow with trust. And the World Economic Forum's Data for Common Purpose Initiative, I'm a member of as well. Uh, so the fintech and uh, collaboration as well as G2G collaboration is another topic I'd like to cover today. Now, let me bring you up to date on developments last year. Now, I also talked about this last year at the seminar, but in the, we have the Sandbox and ABI. And for these two items, there have been some changes. So in the, uh, the financial in intermediaries, there was a major difference or change in uh, the regulatory framework. Uh, the uh, laws were revised last December, and uh, so currently the Japanese financial services industry is being restructured toward uh, such uh, financial service intermediary businesses. As for sandboxes, uh, initially, it was a three-year limited temporary legislation, but it was made a permanent law last year, and from here onwards, it will continue uh, to be operated as a permanent framework. Next, in the digital field, there were some major developments last year. One is the national data strategy. Uh, 
which was announced as a national strategy in June, and also uh, the uh, digital agency was established that same month. Digitalization in Japan is uh, very much uh, behind others, but I'm hoping that through this uh, data strategy, digitalization will be promoted uh, across the government agencies. And of course, as is written here, international collaboration is very important. Uh, so under the concept of uh, DFD, a data free flow with trust, I'm sure that international collaboration in the area of data will also be promoted. So I miss that national data strategy. There is one important concept that is data exchange or creating a data marketplace. Now, this is to exchange data across domains or industries. It's a, a data platform or framework for that exchange, and uh, it'll be an exchange. So there's a strong analogy with the financial exchanges in its uh, structure and design. So the fintech industry would also like to be involved in the design and the implementation or verification of such data exchanges going forward. And I'm involved in the World Economic Forum, and in August of last year, they issued a briefing paper, uh, uh, and uh, they have also made recommendations on governance, etc., for such data marketplaces. Now I'd like to talk about some more specific initiatives. One is an ideathon, which is held every year in Japan. It's uh, well, there's a large fintech conference called FinSum, and last year they initiated an ideathon, and the fintech association, as well as the Japan Financial Services Agency, are supporters. And there were five teams, uh, and. Um, the idea was how to create a trust in non-face-to-face -face financial activities. That was a theme. They made various new proposals, and uh, which was evaluated by the participants. Now, this is a multi-stakeholder ideation, which is uh, starting to take place here in Japan as well. And uh, the final update news, uh, last spring, uh, the Japanese fintech companies and uh, UK venture capitals held a meetup, and uh, the uh, people at the Financial Services Agency and uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Government gave us some support, and uh, we had an online meetup or matchup uh, between UK investors and the Japan fintech companies, which we would like to continue to have going forward. Now, I'd like I have just shared with you, uh, I would like to share with you some specific uh, collaboration ideas. Uh, now, the, on the left-hand side, there are four life cycles of innovative solutions. The first is ideation, then POC and commercial implementation and international expansion. At each stage in the UK, they have tech sprints, digital sandbox, regulatory sandbox, and uh, GFIN uh, as frameworks to promote each of these life cycles. And the skill box was a most recent uh, proposal. And for each stage of the innovation solution, especially in the ideation and POC stage, uh, we face many challenges in uh, Japan. One is that uh, uh, we don't have a digital ideation and testing environments uh, like they have in the UK with digital sandbox or regulatory sandbox. Uh, so we wanted to emulate the digital sandbox and co-host a UK-Japan cross-border tech, tech sprint. We want to do that. Most recently, uh, in the area of sustainable finance, a tech sprint has already been held. And uh, TMG s uh, said that uh, their major keyword is green, and Japanese companies and startups we wanted to create a route for them to be able to participate freely in these tech sprints. So digital sandboxes and data or API collaboration will be necessary uh, cross-border. And to do that, we need the interoperability of uh, cross-border data transfers between the UK and Japan. And so we want to validate such interoperability and in parallel with these uh, tech sprints. Next, for commercial implementation and international expansion, I, I said earlier that in in Japan, a meetup, a UK-Japan meetup was held, I said, and we, but there's still a major funding gap 
during the scale-up stage. So not only startups and investors, but we want to become a bridge against or between many, many fintech players. And we also want to collaborate with the UK ecosystem as much as we can. And last is a sandbox. Uh, collaboration, which is very difficult because the Japanese sandbox uh, belongs under the cabinet secretary, and therefore there has been very little collaboration with financial authorities. However, we want to continue the sandbox collaboration with the UK without giving up. And in Japan, uh, because it's placed under the cabinet secretariat, not only finance, but maybe cross-domain, for example, uh, data exchange between uh, finance and electric power companies, uh, I think that could be promoted. So cross-domain, which is very good in Japan, and cross-border, uh, the strength of UK could be combined together into cross-border partnership and funding for sandboxes. That's my hope. So those are my proposals. And in 2022, uh, between uh, Japan and the UK and Tokyo and London, I do hope that we can have uh, more and more collaborations. Uh, and I'm looking forward to what it can bring in the next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kito. Next, we will move on to the Japanese company's speech presentations. The first speaker is Mr. Daisuke Murata, president of Crowd Loan Corporation. Mr. Murata, please start. Thank you. I am Murata. I'm from Crowd Loan. I'd like to introduce you to CrowdLoan, Japan's first lending platform that smoothly connects individuals and banks through loans. This is a company profile. CrowdLoan was established in 2018, and we are connected with 20 companies. And I am a former banker at Sumishin SBI NetBank, and after working for two startups, I started my own business. Here is a question. What comes up to your mind when you hear the word loans? Not too many people are using loans on a regular basis, so you may have no idea if the loan you find are suitable for you or not, and you may be worried about losing money. In addition, few people have the time to reach out to the bank to ask for a loan. When it comes to loans, you have no one close to consult, and many people are, end up fa failing to choose the right loan. As an example of a failure in choosing a loan, let me use the case of buying a car. When comparing the loan repayment of a 3.3 million yen car over five years, the difference between a bank loan with a lower interest rate and the consumer credit dealer loan with a higher interest rate is 620,000 yen. As you can see, if you make the wrong choice, you could end up paying 10,000 yen more per month, and the only only for car loans, there are as many as two, 2 million people annually who make this kind of the differences. So as the first bank lending platform in Japan, CrowdLoan has created a system that allows users to find out which loans they can have and access at a glimpse without any hassle and to secure finance intelligently so that they do not fail to choose the right loan. Users can complete the application for the crowd loan by entering their purpose of use, desired amount of money, annual income, area of residence, and other diagnostic information. Next, a prior screening process is conducted by a guarantee company affiliated with the crowd loan and based on the result the user can receive a proposal with crowd loan system users can compare interest rates and loan amounts presented and select and apply for bank loans which are almost certain to be available and the, uh, so that uh, the, we already have the partnered with 20 financial institutions, and we will continue to increase this number. Our goal is to increase the number of partners to 60 by the end of this year. The market size of unsecured loan for individuals is quite large. Annual new lending, including card loans and loans with purposes, amounts to 21 trillion yen. In the domestic market, there are already lending the leading platformers such as Yale and others in the area of mortgage loans that act as intermediaries to banks, but we plan to dominate the area of unsecured loans where the balance of new loans is almost the same. And here, 
the, we have we have been centering around the the automobile purchase, but the, we'd like to move on to other areas as well. For example, the medical institution, the uh, re the rental property contracts, medical institutions, moving and education related businesses, and so forth. Currently, we are planning to strengthen our alliance with the company that provides core banking systems and CRM, as well as with the business company that owns consumer business, which would bor the, the borrow the potential borrowers, and to expand our business as Japan's first service that provides enabler service. And also, the it is the widely the BNPL is widely used. So, in the case of cloud service. We are able to connect with the banks and others. So that means that the from 1 million yen to 10 million yen, such as cars, sales, medical treatment, and others, uh, as an enabler to collaborate with banks so that users can use the service at the lowest possible interest rate. What's in it for business companies to join in? By utilizing cloud loan functions, they can enjoy various benefits in reducing opportunity losses by offering installment payments. So that means that the, uh, on top of the, the various benefits enjoyed by the business companies, users are able to, com to compare loans that are available and re receive quick responses. And lenders, the uh, IE banks, can benefit from increased awareness of their loan products. So this is the way we realize we see we, they triple the borrower structure. So the, we sincerely wish to see the entry into this kind of system. We'd like to invite all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Murata-san. Now going on to Meme Company Limited, we have with us Representative Director Ms. Mai Saito. Saito-san, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I am Mai Saito of Meme Company Limited. Uh, our purpose is to help kids learn how to spend, save, and earn money. The Japanese government aims to increase cashless payments to about 40% of all transactions by 2025. The cashless rate has increased under the COVID-19 pandemic. Cashless is very convenient, but as parents shift to cashless, and stop using cash, kids lose the opportunity to earn petty cash by running shopping errands or doing chores. Yet in Japan, there's no secure cashless payment solution for kids that parents can feel safe in providing their children. These kids are mostly digital natives. More than 80% can access the internet to play games, but most payments on the net use credit cards and other cashless means. The number of inquiries involving trouble over online charging for apps and games is increasing, and close to half involve elementary school children. There's a growing need to teach digital native kids about financial literacy. But Japan's global ranking in financial literacy is 38th, which is one of the lowest amongst the developed nations. Japanese children are not given the opportunity to learn about money either at school or in life. The parents aren't sure of how to teach about money because they haven't been trained. Yet, there is no secure cashless tool that parents can entrust their kids with, which results in less opportunities for children to handle money. This was the issue we aimed to resolve with the development of a mobile co application called Manimo. Manimo can help kids do four things. First, they can earn money by doing chores. Second, they can save their allowances and money earned by usage or savings goal. Third, the money saved in their accounts can then be used for payments at real stores or online with a Visa debit card. And fourth, all transactions can be managed by the parent and child with a single application, giving kids practical daily experiences in handling money and enhancing their financial literacy. Other features include parental control and in-app transfer of money between parent and child. Children learn chores and also learn to wisely use the money earned. The savings feature reduces uh, wasteful spending and real-time notification increases visibility. 
since the cash culture still persists strongly in certain segments of Japan, savings can be withdrawn as cash at ATMs, and grandparents can also transfer money to kids. This is the competition in Japan. And these Japanese prepaid card companies provide easy-to-use services without age restrictions to anyone. But at this point in time, there is no other service that focuses on kids and enhancing the kids' financial literacy. Next, about traction. And this application is due to be released in spring this year. We are currently working to develop and issue real debit cards in partnership with GMO Aozora Net Bank. Next is the market size. Based on the number of families with small children in Japan, the TAM, or total addressable market, is $240 billion, and SOM, or serviceable obtainable market, is about $5.3 billion. Our initial target will be $5 million kids ages 10 to 14, and through marketing campaigns, we aim to capture a market share of 3 percent as KPI. Our monetization strategy is based on a monthly subscription model, and other revenues will be sales uh, through business uh, tie-ups. And our future plan is to become the financial literacy platform ki for kids with various services, we want to make sure with a vision that the next generation of adults can handle and manage money better than the current generation of parents. Thank you very much, Ms. Saito. Next, I'd like to introduce Mr. Yuki Kishi, Chief Financial Officer of Sustainable Lab. Please take the floor. Hi, uh, hello everyone. My name is Yuki Kishi. I'm the CFO at Sustainable Lab. In the coming seven, uh, coming five minutes, I'd like to talk about our company and our plan as well. Okay. Um, so, uh, what's happening in the current society? As you may know, that obviously the SDGs, ESGs, circular economy, um, these wordings and these movements are uh, becoming really big matter for many enterprises governments, as well as um, financial institutions. Um, in short, we are moving towards the sustainability transformations. And um, what, in, other, in other words, the companies will be analyzed from not only financial perspective, but also non-financials, uh, like, like ESGs, SDGs perspective. And this is, I believe, unstoppable trend at the moment uh, at global scale. Hence, uh, there are many companies and financial institutions trying to adopt in this new environment. So in this mega trend, uh, we, we see many problems at the moment. Uh, if you look at from financial institutions, um, there are people involved in ESG sectors, such as um, ESG strategists, uh, equity analysts, bond analysts, M&A bankers, and uh, asset, manager, asset managers, and so on. And currently, there are many ESG initiatives and the ratings that makes them really hard for them to compare with different measures. And usually, logics are different and often pretty much black box. So basically at this moment, there are no worldwide uh, standards to assess and evaluate non-financial data. And that's why they're having many, many problems and spending a good amount of times on this. And we, we see that uh, roughly 100,000 analysts are spending on this workflows. Uh, if you look at from enterprise side, we also see a huge problems at the moment. And let's say, uh, from the corporate planning, investor relations team, sustainability teams, uh, they're often getting many orders from their top management to work on um, ESG initiatives. Now, once again, um, based on our research, they're also facing many issues, like they're not sure how to measure their sustainability or SDG progresses initiatives. Uh, they're not sure how they are doing against their competitors at the moment. And once again, unfortunately, there are no standard measures to answer these questions. And that's what that's why we are here today. Uh, we are here to solve these problems. And uh, Terrust, which is our product, flagship product, is an AI-powered ESG SDGs data bank. Uh, we collect data, uh, mainly uh, we collect uh, ESG SDG related data 
from open data sources, um, closed, as well as alternative data sources. And we analyze them and generate uh, sustainability scores. Um, how our customers uh, can utilize our trust? Uh, we have two segments. One is financial institutions, and the latter is enterprise, uh, enterprise people. So if you look at from uh, ESG analysts in, in, in financial institutions, uh, they can now access uh, access multiple sustainability scores, uh, sustainability data sources, easy to compile, analyze, and generate outputs. And if you look at from the uh, enterprise side, so let's say sustainability teams in the enterprise side, it is really beneficial for them to quickly um, understand their sustainability scores, and it makes it makes them really easy to see where their strengths and weaknesses are and their market positioning in the ESG SDG spaces. So Trust can now give them insights in terms of how to make them better uh, sustainability strategy and actions. And this is a quick um, uh, competitive landscape of uh, where we are against our, compet uh, against our competitors. We are different in mainly two ways. Uh, number one, uh, we are disclosing scores methodologies, scoring methodology and, and uh, logics. Uh, usually, it's it's uh, as mentioned, it's really black box at the moment. And second, we are providing many, we are providing multiple strategies uh, against uh, single sing, uh, single methodologies like the other peers are providing, because based on research, that many investors and enterprises they have different needs, they they have different focus points. Hence, depending on their philosophies and focus points, we are providing, we're trying to provide uh, the best scenarios, best simulations uh, as much as possible. That's why we're providing multiple strategies as a multiple methodologies at the moment. Um, this is our leadership team. Uh, CEO Hirasa, he's a serial entrepreneur. Uh, Mr. Kato, who is a non-exec director, he is also a man uh, management committee member of uh, GPIF, which is the largest uh, government-owned pension fund in Japan. And uh, we do have good achievements so far, already getting more than 30 plus clients. We're working with the top tier accelerators and we're working with the government as well as uh, universities. And we, we did present in the COP26 last year as well. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, based in Japan at the moment, but we are planning to go abroad. And of course, UK and London is one of our main targets. So if you can help us, support us to achieve that goal, that would be perfect. Wonderful. wonderful. Uh, let's get connected. I hope to speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kishi. Next. Uh, the title is Why it's important to facilitate fintech engagement investment management. The speaker is the CEO of Investment Association of the UK, Mr. Chris Cummings. So, Mr. Cummings, please. Hello, good morning. My name is Chris Cummings, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Investment Association. It's terrific to be with you here today and to hear all of the exciting news between London and Tokyo in FinTech. Um, and I would add my thanks to those of the Lord Mayor and previous speakers for the ability to speak to you today at such an exciting moment in the industry's development. I also look forward to meeting our good friend from Sus Lab and welcoming him to London very soon. Please do be in touch. And that goes for all the other FinTechs that we've heard from today as well. Well, I'm delighted to be here today talking about the future and innovation of investment management and better deployment of fintech. Last year, my colleague, Jack Knight, spoke at the Tokyo London Summit, and we're grateful for the opportunity to be here again today. International collaboration is crucial to the efficient deployment and uptake of fintech, and we're pleased now to have the opportunity to work along side so many great Japanese-based partners. Could I have the first slide, please? Thank you. Well, the last couple of years have certainly been an interesting time for the global economy, with numerous challenges and opportunities still ahead. But we look to the future with great confidence and hopefully moving beyond the pandemic and being able to have conferences such as today's back in person again. The UK has continued to thrive 
And today I'm able to report that we retain our crown as the preeminent global asset management center. And not only that, but just a great place to do business. Total UK assets under management reached a staggering £9.4 trillion in 2020. That's an impressive 11% year-on-year growth with some £4.2 trillion managed for clients overseas. We will continue to see a very dynamic landscape but that requires increased customer focus right in the heart of product development with better client engagement and an even closer scrutiny of the options available to come to the right solutions for our clients. And while sustainability and responsible investment have emerged as a standout theme during the pandemic, innovation is key to shaping the success that our sector has always thrived by and continues to make the UK that international leader. Next slide, please. We are proud that the UK is seen as a globally attractive nation of entrepreneurs, innovators, and also implementers. Despite the pandemic, the UK also retains its position as a global leader in fintech. Global total capital investment into fintech was in excess of $102 billion in 2021. That's a 183% increase in just a year. And indeed, the last in the last year, the UK fintech centre leapt forward by a staggering 217% year-on-year growth. $11.6 billion of investment was seen, and that's more than the next five European countries combined. The UK really is Europe's global fintech centre. And it's not just here in London that we see such fantastic clusters of fintech, financial services, professional services with asset management at its core. The UK ecosystem really is a national asset. And hubs such as Edinburgh, Cardiff, Belfast, Birmingham, and my hometown of Leeds continue to show that actually fintech innovation is strong throughout the whole of the UK. An impressive 2,500 fintechs have made the UK their home, with a growing number seeing investment management as an opportunity to redefine existing processes and enhance business models. That means greater innovation, reduced costs, and better client outcomes. And all of that comes from an ability to benefit global markets, access global talent, and of course, make the most of that global connectivity that London is renowned for. And that's set against a background of supportive policy and regulation, access to high skills, a record of strong investment, and of course, an international outlook, all supported by national connectivity that creates an environment that facilitates innovation. Next slide, please. Technology spend and investment management continues to focus on real use cases, first identifying the business problem and then seeking a solution that reduces costs and improves client outcomes. Within this somewhat nebulous term of FinTech sits RoadTech, WealthTech, PropTech, Climate Tech, and probably many, many other techs as well. But ultimately, it's about working smarter, creating efficiencies, and improving client outcomes. But it's that whole ecosystem where fintech splits, divides, and focuses on individual market segments that gives London and the whole of the UK its European and international edge because of those deep, deep markets that are available and that strength and expertise that we have. 
Access to and the ability to analyze data underpins the majority of the requirements for change. The collection, analysis, and usage is ultimately where we will see most benefits. We're looking at, looking at leveraging existing data sets and applying behavioral analytics to deliver nudges to portfolio managers or in right tech solutions to use AI, machine learning, simply to find the edge to improve client outcomes. And it's an exciting time to be in the market. It's this collaboration and innovation from front office to back office that will ultimately facilitate improved performance. Understanding where tech spend is taking place, what the challenges are, and what everyone else is doing is vital for our members and indeed for the wider sector. With focus on improving customer experience, generating operational efficiencies, addressing regulatory changes, and indeed seeking out new competitive edges are the secret for London's success for the future. And we've seen that the pandemic has on the whole accelerated the digital strategy of firms across our industry. Yes, budgets might be coming under increased pressure, but actually all that's done is increase the appetite for FinTech solutions that work. Legacy infrastructure, siloed data, lack of connectivity and cultures that are significant inhibitors to transformation A yesterday's story. Today, we're looking at an industry that is at the leading edge of competition, where we are deploying smart tech, where architecture redesign and technology leadership are the fundamental building blocks of change and success. As highlighted now, best practice today includes personalized portfolio construction, better client engagement models, and data-enabled data customer-centric strategies that harness the finest data science capabilities that our universities and leading-edge fintech companies can bring to bear. We're seeing that firms are continuing to develop data architecture, and the digital experience and advanced analytics are key strategic priorities for our firms. Well, we heard a little bit earlier about the need for a green transition. And it's certainly true that asset owners and regulatory pressures make sure that actually when it comes to fintech and asset management, there's a huge priority on those um, green outcomes. And client values are at the forefront of innovation, and we've seen significant areas in the growth of ESG investing. Data and the use of AI is at the forefront of this change, and the IA will continue to help members and firms across the entire industry better use artificial intelligence in order to deliver best outcomes. Now, I'm particularly interested in the greater use of distributed ledger technology. I think it offers significant opportunities. And let's face it, we're still at the very early days of seeing the sweeping changes that DLT is going to make to our industry. So in the next 12 to 24 months, we at the IA will be working even more closely with our member firms in order to generate solutions that better deploy distributed ledger technology throughout the industry. Could I have my final slide, please? So the Investment Association is unique, and I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, in our approach to innovation by offering the engine, which the Lord Mayor kindly referred to. It's our, our accelerator and solutions hub. Our mission has always been to fuel the adoption of technology within investment management for the benefit of, our, of the industry's changing client needs. And it's our national and also our international networks that set us apart. And we're delighted to be partnering with eight financial centers, with Japan and our partnerships with JIAM and Phenolab, very much at the core of this global partnership program. Other partners are on the screen, including Abu Dhabi, Doha, Dubai, Singapore, Hong Kong, Saudi Arabia, and of course, Australia. 
Our Global Partners Programme is not just about signing MOUs. It's actually about accessing different markets, engaging with the finest fintech thinking and bringing innovation and a degree of disruption into the regions. Our relationships continue to grow from strength to strength. We very much look forward to building our relationships with fintechs and investment management firms across the whole of Japan. And I look forward to welcoming you to London as soon as we can. Very best wishes for this year's conference and good luck with your businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummings. Next, Mr. Colin Bennett, Head of Marketing and Client Experience, GAM Investments, who will speak on the topic of the future of fintech in investment management and the need for innovation. Good morning. I'm Colin Bennett. I'm Head of Marketing and Client Experience at GAM Investments. GAM Investments is a global asset manager that delivers investment management, wealth management, and fund management services to its clients globally. I'm also uh, on the advisory panel and serve there for the Investment Association's FinTech Accelerator engine. Today, I'd like to explore what the future looks like and why it's time to innovate and give you a view from the investment management sector. Firstly, I'd like to explore innovation. Uh, innovation is an embodiment and a useful idea in, of a useful idea in the marketplace. And if we look at that definition, there are two realms. There's a human realm and the physical reality, how people interact with each other and create value, and the science, technology, the planet, and the materials. And where those two things come together, you get this sweet spot. And that's the ultimate condition for innovation and impact. And we saw some really great startups from Japan this morning and some talks around that. And that's exploiting where you solve real world problems and successfully bring them to market. So if we actually explore those two halves of innovation, if we look at the human side, the next generation of investors are being rewired. There's some statistics here that I'd quickly like to go through. 90% of millennials check their smartphones every 15 minutes after waking up. 88% of them bank online. Interestingly, 73% of young consumers trust Google, Apple, and Amazon more than their bank. If you look on the right-hand side there, 71% of them would rather go to the dentist than actually listen to the bank. If we look at that, 66% of those millennials will fire their parents' financial advisor when, their next, when the wealth transfer occurs. They're five more um, times likely to get financial advice from social media. And if you look into social media like TikTok, for example, hashtag investing has had at least 3.3 billion views. <clears throat> so much so in the UK, the regulator, the FCA, is running a campaign uh, to prevent online investment harm because people are more going online for investment advice than actually going to professional and qualified people. Millennials are more life motiv goal motivated and they invest with purpose. You know, the AUM for thematic equity products and sustainable climate solutions will hit 30 trillion by 2030. Now, if we look at the other side of the innovation definition, the physical reality for finance, it's changing super fast. I won't go through them all, but we've got things like quantum and cloud. We've got assets being increasingly digitized. We've got decentralized finance. We've got, um, for investment management, moving to real-time reporting is new. Artificial intelligence is exploding. Central bank digital currencies and cryptocurrencies are all coming at us. And then if we look at um, the different um, industrial revolutions, shall we say, in the old days, the industrial revolution was energy-driven. And you can see from that linear chart, it was very linear. Energy grew at a linear rate. But if you look now at the computing environment and digital environment for that's powering fintech, for example, it's exponential and it's grown 300 times in 20 years, which is at orders of difference than the past. And if we look at the value creation in a digital world, we've got two fundamental laws, Moore's law and Metcalfe's law. I won't describe those now, but what you can see is those laws are describing that Moore's law is saying that we're getting cheaper, cheaper computing power at lower cost, and it's giving us higher capacity. And then we've got more network coming up, 
higher value, um, reach higher potential and more reach. As the nodes of the networks increase, that value gap is now getting bigger and bigger. And that's where fintechs have a unique opportunity to exploit that value gap using digital technology. Finance is being revolutionized one bit at a time. You can see very roughly from the left-hand side here, we're showing that the um, bank is being atomized. Each individual service or component is being specialized, potentially by a fintech or others, and they are improving the quality of those, and they're focusing directly on that to make that the, an excellent experience that you would expect, but also making sure that it's always up to date and the latest technology. But as this fragmentation of the industry and happens, we need to have integration standards. And there's a challenge there of how do we bring that back and rebundle it all together? And open standards will become a big driver in that respect. Against this background, what happens? Do partners, um, do we build, partner, or buy, or stay in the race? As investment managers or fintech startups, we have a number of challenges. As an incumbent, we need agility, but we've got technical debt. As a startup, you need resilience, but the rapid growth tends to um, outweigh some of the fast developments that you've done in the past. So there's a, potentially a growth issue. You also need profitability as a startup. The incumbents have the clients, but not the technology. The startup have the technology, but not the clients. And when you're looking at fintechs and such as robo advice, those type of things, people are realizing it's not just the technology, human relationships count. You need to deliver the human side as well as the technology side. The thing is that the landscape is ripe for innovative approaches, acquisitions, mergers, and partnerships and consolidation to configure the best propositions for the future are rife. As we saw recently with UBS targeting a wealth front acquisition to grow into the United States. If we now look at the wealth techs and the investment apps, just very quickly, these are things that are actually exploding on people's phones now. You know, 12% of UK adults now are using an investment app. That's a difference. That didn't happen before. We've got a very, very rapid user base adoption. An example here is one app came out in May, and it got 140,000 new Android users pretty much immediately. That's pretty good growth. We've got 3.2 million Brits downloaded a wealth app since the pandemic started. So it's already COVID is accelerating the take on and onboarding into investment apps. They offer great choice and user experience. And we, to get to the budget point, incumbents may have budget constraints, but the startups, if you're lucky, don't. They have huge amounts of funding rounds. You know, there was 1.7 billion going into U Europe's wealth techs in 2021. So they can fund these growths and this, these developments. If we very quickly look at um, the sweet spot, hybrid advice, you know, the traditional approaches that asset managers, investment managers, wealth managers were using before are being revolutionized and changed and move into the hybrid realm where we're using half the di digital to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of these technologies and offer bespoke and personalized solutions. And we're using the personal and um, relationship side to ensure that there is someone, a human there to actually answer the questions, actually to give advice and form those relationships in a long-term basis to look after your client outcomes. And more importantly, at the moment, for the sustainable client outcomes to make sure that that is on the right rails. A quick example of um, an open aggregator in financial services to show you that ecosystems are developing. In India, um, some of the top banks put together some rails and created an ecosystem for 150 million people um, within India. And they've got um, collaboration with major organizations such as Google, Facebook, PhonePe, et cetera. And they're doing 3.3 billion transactions each month currently. And they're creating this account aggregator that creates this one place that you can manage all your finances and give you a digital footprint, which is demo providing the democratizing of credit. It's a big step forward. And if you see on this chart on the right, it covers not only payments, it's also investments, insurance, mutual funds, lending. This is a platform that people need to be able to play in. And in order to do so, should be thinking about open standards and things in order to integrate those um, organizations and functions together. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm, I'm lucky enough to serve on the Investment Association's Engine FinTech Accelerator. 
And as such, we have um, a, a round every year of looking at the problems that we're trying to solve and, and looking at the fintechs that can solve it. And this is a, a sample list of the problem statements that we're looking at. So with investments, it's managing data products and services, You know how to manage that data, how to map the numerous ESG standards, how to be in more, more informed around investment decisions and across country and um, cross company teams and how to link instrument and issuer data in addition to positions and portfolios funds with the ever increasingly important ESG data. On operations, it's supporting the client journey, removing established silos practices, consolidating requirements from a regulatory point of view and automating those outputs and creating fast, transparent, automated and digital client experiences. And in, within distribution, it's still about delivering the client experience, attracting and supporting the underserved retail investor, delivering better user outcomes for customers, baseline published, publish baseline ESG data, and collect client preference data to deliver a more personalized service. So I'm going to come back to the definition. It's about the embodiment of a useful idea in the marketplace. For the human realm, you've got to know exactly what value you add. For the physical reality, you've got to have a future fit investment product and service platform. And you've got to find that sweet spot where you can really solve those real world problems and successfully bring them to market. And my final challenge to you is to make a positive difference. It is 100% up to you to make this difference. People trust the investment industry with their futures. And I ask you, will you stand by or will you help innovate for future success? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ban Bennett. Next, thriving through disruption in asset management, we have with us Mr. Christian McIntosh, who is the Director of Asset Management at KPMG UK. Mr. McIntosh, please. Good morning to those in London and good evening to those in Tokyo. My name is Christian McIntosh, and I am a director for KPMG in the UK, where I lead on technology, innovation, and disruption for wealth and asset management. It is a great pleasure to be invited to speak to you today. The UK-Japanese corridor is a vital fulcrum of the global economy, and I congratulate the Tokyo Metropolitan Government and the City of London on this important initiative to further strengthen the economic bonds that link our two remarkable cities. Over the next few minutes, I'd like to share some of KPMG's latest research on the global fintech market and the way that asset managers in the UK are responding to the opportunities of disruption. Twice a year, KPMG undertakes detailed research of global deal activity and trends in fintech. In the most recent figures published last week, we revealed that total global investment in fintech reached a record $210 billion in the year 2021 across private equity, venture capital, and M&A. The UK is the world's second largest destination for fintech investment, with a total of $37 billion over the year, accounting for 18% of the global total and about 50% of the deal volume for the entire EMEA region. Fintech is an area of key comparative advantage for the UK, one which developed organically thanks to the UK's vibrant finance ecosystem, but which now also represents a key plank of the government's trade and economic policy. Our research identified a number of trends likely to dominate in 2022. Firstly, we're seeing a remarkable resurgence in cross-border M&A activity. The economic and social restrictions imposed by the COVID pandemic acted as a severe drag on international deal-making in 2020. So it is pleasing to see volumes treble in 2021. We expect this trend to continue through 2022 as global players seek to scale and diversify. Secondly, we're seeing a continued shift in focus and valuations toward B2B services like risk and compliance, a recognition of the huge value that these offerings can provide, but also of investors' needs to cast an ever wider net in the hunt for the next great unicorn. As fintech becomes increasingly embedded in the fabric of our economies, the distinction with the wider technology vendor landscape will continue to blur. Interest in cybersecurity skyrocketed in 2021, driven by the growth in digital services and a less stable geopolitical environment. Funding towards cyber doubled last year, and we expect to see significant corporate investment through 2022. 
And finally, ESG shot up the global agenda in 2021. And whilst investment so far has lagged behind other areas, we expect to see a significant growth trajectory over the next five years. Now, 10 years ago, it might have been just about possible to claim that asset management was a staid, traditional business, one with a conservative, cautious approach to change. But those days are long gone. Today, investment firms are re-architecturing themselves to serve a more diverse, more demanding global investor base, one which requires access to an ever wider pool of investments, which prizes non-financial factors alongside core returns, and which expects the same technology maturity from their asset managers as from Amazon or Apple. For the industry, this means a squeeze middle, where the beneficiaries are either the smaller houses with clear specialization or the scale players with the gravitational pull to gather assets. For the mid-tier, survival increasingly becomes a question of acquire, be acquired, or innovate. Innovation doesn't just happen, though. Our work with asset managers shows that there are a number of critical factors on which successful innovation depends. For leaders, true innovation is rarely prescriptive, but it's also not often a product of anarchy. Organizations succeed where teams have clear parameters for success and the flexibility to experiment in achieving it. Asset managers serve their investors above all, and innovation is likeliest to succeed where it meets a clear investor demand. No organization has a monopoly on wisdom, so the wisest of those organizations will treat fintechs and other vendors as equal partners on an innovation journey. Likewise, innovation thrives in markets with a rich research and development ecosystem, with strong trade bodies and advocacy groups to connect the nodes. Innovation happens where the brightest and most diverse minds are brought together, which benefits those markets most open to global talent. And governments and regulators have a critical role in creating innovation-friendly environments through taxation, investment, policy, and other frameworks. So, how is innovation making itself felt today? I'd like to highlight three really exciting areas. Firstly, more and more asset managers are beginning to recognize the potential of their technology and perhaps to look with some envy at the valuation multiples enjoyed by tech firms. Whilst these efforts were initially concentrated in trading platforms and the middle and back office space, I am increasingly speaking to organizations looking to commercialize their software in areas like quant, big data, and distribution, previously considered too commercially sensitive. The potential rewards are enormous, but of course, not all can succeed. So asset managers must weigh their options carefully. Secondly, all investing, whether quantitative or fundamental, is becoming more data hungry. It is no longer sufficient to treat batch data, streaming data, and alternative data as separate silos, especially with ESG at the top of investors' agendas. Tools which help to understand, value, and navigate this vastly richer data environment are becoming mission critical to asset managers and present huge opportunities for fintech. And finally, we are beginning to see a much more dynamic relationship between asset managers and their service providers. No longer a one-way transaction, but a partnership in which technology and expertise is shared and services are co-created. For asset managers, this means more value and better insight. For service providers, it is, means stickier relationships, but at the cost of needing to challenge and reinvent established ways of working. In summary, I am really excited and heartened by the way that our industry is embracing and responding to disruption. London and Tokyo are dynamic, innovative cities. By strengthening the bonds that link us, we can be and remain at the forefront of that change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McIntosh. We will now move on to the U.S. company's speech presentations. The first U.K. company is Mr. Lucky Ahmed, CEO and co-founder of ClimateX. Mr. Ahmed, please take the floor. Hi, everyone, and thank you for having me uh, today. I'm going, my name is Lucky. I'm co-founder and CEO of ClimateX. And um, I'm going to go through quite a lot of information. So I'm sure a lot of you will have a lot of questions around the work that we do 
around climate risk and uh, predictive data analytics. So the world around us is already changing um, faster than we're adapting to it. So in many parts of the world, uh, whether it's in parts of America with wildfire, Europe with significant flood events like we've never seen before, or landslide, for example, in places like Japan, um, we've all lived through some of these events that are causing significant damage and disruption to people's lives, and lives are actually being lost. There's also an economic impact that's attached to these types of events. So just to put some of that into scale, you can see here, for example, the average salary of somebody in the UK is around $40,000 a year. And that's negligible to the wealth of some of the, those uh, billionaires on this planet, like Elon Musk, who's uh, sitting at 278 billion, the equivalent of an entire country GDP, or even Apple's uh, market cap, for example, soared past $3 trillion earlier uh, in, in the last month. But all of these things pale in comparison to the cost that's expected to climate change related risks to the global economy. We were expecting $23 trillion by 2050 under a high emission scenario. And the thing is that this future is not something that's inevitable, it's not mutable. And in fact, we're in a position now with the latest technology and computational power that we can actually project some of these physical risks decades before they happen. And that's where Climate X comes in and the work that we've been doing uh, with our products, such as Spectra, which allows governments and businesses around the world to build resilience against climate change by understanding in advance what risk ratings might apply to specific locations and also loss estimates. We calculate financial impacts um, under different hypothetical scenarios. And we do that because we've been able to build the digital twin of the Earth, so block by block, street by street, we've mapped out the entire country in a simulation. And then what we've done is we found a way to switch on the laws of physics and simulate multiple weather effects over the coming decades in order to understand what it takes to create, for example, a flood event in a particular city or town. And we can do that at a very high resolution. Once we've done that, we then connect that to the uncertainties that are associated with different climate pathways. And that gives us a probability and severity of uh, specific events like flooding, subsidence, landslides, uh, extreme heat, cold, and, and beyond. And we provide a 360 view across the different types of physical risks that will affect uh, people's assets. And that could be properties, for example, if you have a mortgage portfolio, that could be um, real estate properties if you're an asset manager, or indeed it could be uh, looking at energy supply and demand if you're uh, operating uh, an energy or utilities company. And the key thing is that this data is proven and it's really working in terms of the accuracy rates. We've managed to wind the clock back to validate the strength of our models. So what you see in front of you is a traditional model where earlier in, sorry, in summer last year in London, there was a flood event that took place on the east end of, east of London. And it was really presented as a low risk area because in the past there was never really any flooding experience. What we found was, though, actually climate change is non-linear and non-stationary. So just because somebody didn't flood in the past, it doesn't mean that that's not likely to happen in the future. Our models provide a very different view of risk in, those, in that particular location. So we can see individual streets and street corners are being uh, particularly affected by climate-related risks, and in this case, rainfall resulting in flooding. And when we tested our models, we found that they successfully reproduced risks in the way that we would have expected. So this, for example, area around a train station has been flooded and inundated with water, exactly as our models predicted. And the same has applied for landslide, for example, where we see that a severity one rating that we'd anticipated on the cliff of uh, a part of uh, Dorset actually did collapse in line with our expectations and our model predictions. And the model um, rates of accuracy that we're now achieving are rising up to around 95 to 98%, depending on the risk type. And so when people use and implement our data in order to understand the risk to the businesses, they can really trust what it is that we're providing to them. And it's super, super simple to access and to utilize our data. Either you can do it via API, or alternatively, you sign in to our online platform, and all we ask you to do is upload a list of addresses or longitude or latitudes. And what we present you with in return is a heat map of the entire country that shows you how those risks are spread geographically, what's driving those risks specifically, and we even provide the cost uh, implications to you in a simple and easy to digest dashboard. And if you want, you can dive into specific assets so you can see what's actually happening with particularly large or interesting exposures. 
and we package it all up into a beautiful report that's dynamically produced. So you can see how risk, for example, changes over time, uh, what the drivers are, and ultimately implement that into your business decision making and strategies. Um, so I'm more than happy to uh, spend more time to go into details about Climate Excellence Services. Just feel free to scan the code on the screen in order to connect with us. So thank you very much for your time and uh, also for inviting us to this uh, event. It's been a pleasure to speak to you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Ahmed. Next, going on to Sapphire, the head of AEMEA, Mr. Max Lam. Mr. Lam, please. Good afternoon, Tokyo. Good morning, London. I am Max Lam, and I'm delighted to be speaking today at the Tokyo London Financial Seminar. Sapphire is a new company. We are under five years old, uh, but we already have the slides are 68, but the number has just increased to over 100 patents. And these patents cover how we remember, for the most part, the relationship between data and documents. And I will explain to you during my presentation why if you're a large bank, an investment manager, a custodian, or an asset owner, this is particularly relevant for you. Looking at the slide, we have JP Morgan, the largest bank, BlackRock, the largest asset manager, and Bank of New York Mellon, a respected financial institution, custodian, and asset manager who are already on the platform, and many others as well. We would be delighted to have more participation from Japan. So what do we do? Well, we replace manual processes for setting up and managing accounts, and that could be custody accounts, broker accounts, trading accounts, client accounts. And this creates efficiency and speed and reduces risk. But more importantly than that, we do something new, which we don't think anyone else does at this point in time. If you take a large bank with an excellent database, a large investment manager with another excellent database, and a large custodian with another excellent database. Then these databases might all be right, but if they are not synchronized with each other, they will sometimes show different things. And this creates problems further down the, uh, further down the trading path. So as an example, an SSI at a sub-custodian might have changed, but if that change hasn't fed through or feeds through slowly to the investment manager, when the trade is placed, it will not automatically settle. A futures clearing account at a broker might have been placed into dormant because it's not been used for six months. An investment manager again places the trade. The trade will not process properly. An LEI might have lapsed, which also stops trading activity. Or AML might have been out of date, which might freeze the account status at the transfer agent or the custodian. These are all an annoyance, but they also create time-bound work for operations teams to resolve. Because of the backdrop of T plus two settlement, moving to T plus one, and eventually to T plus naught. And what we have done is create a system and a platform which helps avoid these problems. Looking at the impact of using the platform for those people who are already on it, we are seeing a 50% reduction in email traffic for brokers, a 75% reduction in email traffic for investment managers. This is email traffic related to onboarding, account setup, trade settlement, and so on. We also see a 35% reduction in failed trade queries. And these failed trade queries take up time on dealing desks, in trade support, and middle office and settlements teams. And on top of that, we are seeing that custody accounts, broker accounts, is the creation, the whole setup process is between 50 and 75% faster, and we expect that number to improve over time. And that has a really important customer service and commercial impact. There's 100% digital transparency and dashboarding of activity when you use our platform. So it lets you make better use of the people you have and give better client service. How do we achieve this? Well, if we look on the left, we see a red circle at the top, which is an asset owner, a pension fund. The pension fund employ employs an investment manager, the red circle on the right. And at the moment, they will exchange information on email, by phone, by spreadsheet, by PDF, sometimes even by fax. The investment manager will need to set up trading arrangements with a custodian, which is the lines to the left, and also 
not just one broker, but often five, 10, 15, 20 brokers. Each of these setups is manual. And this is not a one-time setup either because it's an ongoing setup as AMS cycles refresh, as SSIs change, as LEIs uh, run out of date. It is an ongoing cycle of manual processes. On the right, we show what we have done with the Sapphire platform. In the middle, an Azure cloud-hosted database to exchange data and workflows related to client reference data and account setup. And with the benefit of the 100 patents that we have, we make it a much more efficient process. We thoughtfully remember information from one context to another. So if you have already opened a broker account on behalf of one client, then when you come to open a broker account, another broker account for the same client, then a lot of that information will be pre-filled. It saves time. It reduces error. And it also makes things better. Same thing with documents, AML and KYC. We remember the context. We, when you replace document, the permissions and the distribution is all automatic and inherited. It saves considerable time and it also saves errors. And what does this mean for the dealing desks? Well, for the dealing desks, we have a unique feature, which we call ready to trade. We present a traffic light either direct to the dealing desk or through Symphony or through Teams or through an API link to your OMS. And that traffic light will say, yes, for this instrument, for this market, for this broker, you can place this trade or no, you can't. And it lets you proactively not place trades which are not ready uh, because the setup is uh, not right. And if you don't place those trades that aren't ready to trade, um, then you won't have failures and allocation and settlement to the same extent, which is the numbers I was telling you about in the previous slide. So in summary, we represent speed, efficiency, better use of people, improvement in accuracy, and from that, a competitive advantage. For investment managers, they can deal with clients in a nicer, better, and quicker way. For banks, they can onboard to an ISTA or a JIMRA or a trading account sooner, which means they're more likely to be there on day one of trading. And in very general terms, by getting the foundations right, the whole of your operational setup is in a much better place. Arigato, thank you very much. And call on Mr. Ian Vickers, CEO of MetCloud. Mr. Vickers, please. Good morning, everyone. And, um... And good afternoon to everyone in Tokyo. I'd like to thank everyone involved in uh, creating this event, in particular, uh, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government and our own City of London Corporation. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about MetCloud. Bear with me a second. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to talk to you about MetCloud and uh, and what we're doing uh, to disrupt the cybersecurity and the cloud uh, uh, space, particularly in the financial services and the fintech space. So uh, I think everyone recognizes that cybercrime is a global issue. Um, uh, cybersecurity uh, always has been... Uh, a particular concern, but it's increasing exponentially as uh, cyber criminals, um, state actors become more so sophisticated in their approach of, uh, of uh, surveillance and disruption. Um, it's widely accepted that it's not a question of if, but when a cyber attack will occur. Coupled with that, cloud, uh, it's a global phenomenon. Um, over the last uh, seven or eight years, uh, the increase in global adoption has been significant. And again, I think it's uh, widely accepted that uh, to improve digitalization 
and uh, reach to all uh, stakeholders and all consumers, then cloud innovation is obviously a strategy that most organizations are now following. And uh, earlier on in one of the talks, uh, Colin Bennett talked about uh, a sweet spot. And I think we've arrived at that sweet spot right now where we're talking about cloud innovation, cloud adoption, um, and we're also talking about, coupled with that, with cybersecurity disruption and uh, cybersecurity uh, crime uh, increasing significantly year on year. Uh, the technology architecture um, of organizations is now critical to success, as I touched on earlier on, and cloud spending has more than tripled in the last year. And we can expect to see continued growth and investment in data with multi-party systems allowing for greater resilience and agility. Um, added to that, developments in AI, and again, uh, quite a lot of the talks today have been talking about the adoption of artificial intelligence uh, blockchain technologies, giving rise to new generations of business intelligence and, uh, and greater democratization of technology. Digital requirements are accelerating and invest in, investors will judge investment management providers on sophistication and user friendliness of their customer interactions. So why MechCloud? Um, obviously there are thousands of uh, IT uh, companies globally. But again, coming back to Colin Bennett's uh, highlighted piece about Sweet Spot, we've been developing our capability uh, now for five years. Um, and we are probably one of the very few organizations globally that can provide such a strong spectrum and portfolio of capability, both in the uh, cloud uh, space and also cybersecurity. Um, we have created our own UK data center capability with private cloud architecture for organizations that require a much higher sophisticated capability of data uh, security and data assurance. We also allow uh, the capability of integrating a symbiotic relationship with public cloud architectures to take advantage of organizations like Microsoft with Office 365 uh, and so forth. So not all data has to sit in a private cloud architecture, but one that has to be architected in a way that uh, provides a much higher level of security assurance for the organizations uh, that are running on our platform. Um, added to that, uh, we provide managed detection and response capabilities. And where that comes into play is that we have cyber surveillance using AI machine learning, um, looking at all of the events that uh, uh, transact through our cloud platform. This helps us identify any uh, emerging threats or any unbe on uh, natural behaviors uh, that uh, occur on a day-to-day -day basis, 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, we look at vulnerability management. So this is one of the biggest key areas of uh, uh, vulnerabilities for organizations with applications that are now running on our cloud platforms. We look at patching them uh, immediately or within very, very small timelines so that we can actually reduce that threat. Uh, cyber surveillance, harnessing AI, which I talked on and machine learning. This is a huge area where we're collaborating with academia, universities in our own city of Birmingham, and uh, developing our own AI machine learning capability to supplement and strengthen the capability already that sits on the platform in some of the partnerships that we work with. One of the biggest areas is uh, of growth around the adoption of AI is user entity behavior analysis, and this will continue to be, become more sophisticated in our understanding of how we can actually uh, use the patterns of behavior to look at security and enhancing that security capability. System monitoring, harnessing AI and machine learning. Well, this is another area where we see ourselves as being uh, significantly different in the market. And we use AI machine learning to look at patterns of operational performance on our system architecture on the cloud. Uh, we look at a complete wrap of managed security services, 
and we provide cyber instance response for those organizations that uh, um, well find themselves in a in a phishing attack or a ransom attack then we can actually respond very quickly with a very uh, detailed planned approach to supporting our clients uh, for that i'd like to thank again everybody involved and arigato and let's get connected thank you very much mr vickers now then, closing marks, uh, we would like to ask the governor of Tokyo, uh, Yuriko Koike, to deliver a closing remark via a video message. Good evening and good morning, everyone. I am Yuriko Koike, governor of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. The TMG is pleased to have co-hosted the Tokyo London Financial Seminar this year again with our friends from the City of London. I would like to thank Lord Mayor, Mr. Vincent Kiveny, and all of our speakers, as well as the seminar viewers and our sponsors, the Financial Services Agency and the FinTech Association of Japan. I am sure today's presentations on the state-of-the-art developments in fintech in the UK and Japan proved to be very meaningful and instructive for everyone. Our world today faces two major crises, COVID-19 and climate change. The Tokyo Metropolitan Government hopes to address both with policies that enable a sustainable recovery by overcoming the corona pandemic and then aiming for sustainable growth. But to materialize, these policies must be backed by finance. That's why the TMG last November launched the Global Financial City Tokyo Initiative 2.0, which upgrades the original version with a renewed focus on green and digital. The Tokyo Green Finance Initiative, or TGFI, is another strategic activity to promote green finance. Starting this year, the TMG will provide support to fintechs in green finance and other foreign financial services companies starting up a business in Tokyo. Already, 48 firms from 17 countries and regions have requested assistance. We are now shortlisting the candidates to help coordinate their entry into the Tokyo market. This initiative will be scaled up further next year. TMG will also accelerate financial digitalization through increased support to attract, locate, and retain fintech companies here in Tokyo. I believe that speedy and timely action in response to dynamic changes in the global landscape can lead to the resolution of social challenges. In closing, I hope the collaboration between the City of London and the TMG may become even stronger so as to usher in an even brighter future for both our cities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Governor Koike. This concludes the Tokyo London Financial Seminar 2022 Future Prospects of Fintech.